All right, everyone, sorry I'm a little late, uh, but we'll get started. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all here tonight. We are starting a new book of the Bible, and we had a suggestion for the book of Ephesians right after Galatians, so it'll be good. Uh, I think it's um, appropriate because we're kind of in the, the Paul reading mode. We kind of understand how to dissect letters a little bit, so dissecting another one is going to be kind of, not easier, but more streamlined as we talk about going through it, so it'll be good. Um, I want to give a quick thank you to Al for uh, putting these new light bulbs in the light so it's easier to read now. It's not as dark in here. Yeah, very, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, Al. Yeah. And uh, Don's husband and Aaron's husband for uh, cleaning up this whole room and getting more spacious and we now can use it for multiple things and there's no longer these dividers here. It's very clean in here. I'm very excited about that. Thank you to them as well. All right. The Bible often gets accused of having contradictions. Many different con contradictions across books of the Bible. And so as we look at another book of the Bible, especially a book written by Paul, we can see, is Paul being consistent here? Are there contradictions between different letters of Paul's writings? Is, is there problems here? Uh, you're going to have to be the judge. I want you to keep in the back of your mind through the next few weeks asking yourself this question from all the stuff we went through Galatians. Is Paul being consistent? Or are there problems here that we have to address? Let's see these, you know, we talk about principles, our Lutheran principles. Do these principles stand outside of just the book of Galatians? Because if we only make our theology off one book of the Bible and ignore the rest of it, that's a big problem, right? No, we want the whole Bible. We want it all to contribute to what we believe. So we're going to keep asking that question, is Paul being consistent as we go through the book of Ephesians? So as we do with every book of the Bible, we're going to talk about the context. What is the book of Ephesians? Well, it's a letter. Just like Galatians was a letter, so is the book of Ephesians. And it's a letter written to the small, actually not so small, churches in Ephesus. Let's talk about that city of Ephesus. At the back of your handout, you see a map. I'm starting to add pictures and all that to these lessons more for the more visual learners, right? Yes, right. You see the map? So where Turkey is, kind of the west coast of Turkey, that's where Ephesus is. A big thing to notice about Ephesus is it's right by the water. It's a port city. And because it's a port city, there's a lot of traffic. It's a, it's a large, large city. About 100,000 people were estimated to live there. Now you might think 100,000 doesn't sound like a lot, but this is 100,000 people 2,000 years ago when the world population might have been 100 million people. Now it's 8 billion but 100,000 back then, whoo, it would have been like the third largest city in the Roman Empire. That's, that's huge. Tons of people are coming in and coming out. Uh, it's a harbor city. It's a lot of commerce. And it's intellectually vibrant. You find when people have money, they can afford to be a philosopher. When people don't have money, they're just working to make ends meet. It's hard for a farmer in the middle collecting grain to start thinking about the meaning of life. They don't have the time. Right? They're busy trying to put food on the table. But when you have money, you can sit around and look at the sky, and look at the stars, and say, who created this all? What does it all mean? Well, Ephesus being so wealthy of a city, there were a lot of philosophers and religious people out there. It was, it was an intellectually rich city, which is great for Paul. Because Paul's a pretty intellectually rich man. And so he can meet people where they are at in Ephesus, this city of commerce, this city that's at the heart of the Roman Empire. Questions, comments so far? Good so far, okay. Furthermore, Ephesus was a very diverse theological city. Kind of like the cities in America, all over the place. Very diverse theology, a lot of different religions. There, there are many Jews there. There's also many pagans, and pagans of all shapes and sizes. You got people worshiping Zeus. You got people worshiping the Egyptian gods. Some people think there were 50 different cults in the church of Ephesus alone. But there was a big one, the big religion of Ephesus. You ready? Artemis. 
Artemis Ephesia, also known as the Lady of Ephesus. This is Zeus's daughter. From the Roman world, she was known as Diana. Here she's known as Artemis, daughter of Zeus. She's associated with life and death and childbirth. When uh, things go wrong and you feel like you're going to die, you call up on Artemis' name for salvation. That was kind of the the pagan tradition there. That's what she was. She was kind of the mother goddess, right? And Artemis, being in the, the pagan religion in the biggest city, one of the biggest cities in the Roman Empire, oh boy, did they have a temple for her? Another picture in the back of your, your page. This is the model of the Temple of Artemis. It's over 60 feet tall, 127 columns, 6 feet in diameter. When you walk into the city, it is the, you know, they, they called it one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Just looking at that picture, just looking at the model. Imagine Paul. He's on his missionary journey. And he's walking into Ephesus, and that's what he sees. Pretty intimidating, right? Because he's going to walk into Ephesus and say, this is all built for nothing. It's a false god. Woo! Right? That's, that's, yeah. That's exact, Carolyn, that's the exact face I'd be making. This is going to be really, really tough. Now, the cool thing about Ephesians is we have a direct connection into the book of Acts. We don't have to imagine how Paul started his ministry there. We can actually read about it, and we'll do that in a moment. Uh, but as you see, being a prophet of the Most High God is a scary task. It's one filled with persecution. It's one filled with weighty decisions. But Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, went into the lion's den and proclaimed the gospel faithfully. Questions, comments so far? It's kind of a little bit of the context. Let's dive a little bit deeper. As I said before, we get a depiction, we get an account of Paul's ministry in the book of Acts. Acts is a book written by the disciple Luke. He's the one who wrote the Gospel of Luke, of the four Gospels, right? He wrote Luke. Acts is not like a letter. It's not a traditional letter. Acts is much more of a narrative account. It's like reading a history book. That's what Acts is. And so what we get from Paul is his letters to these congregations. What we get from Luke and Acts is the historical progression of the church, starting from when Jesus ascended into heaven, going all the way through Peter and John's work in Jerusalem, to Saul's conversion, to Paul's ministry, Saul to Paul, his ministry journeys all throughout the Roman Empire. We get... We get chapters and chapters of accounts of this, which is very good to look at. So we're going to do that today because we get an account of Paul's first trip, first and only trip to Ephesus in Acts, Acts chapter 18. So we want to turn to Acts today. It's after John. We all got different Bibles, though, so I can't give you the page number. Acts 18, sorry, 18. This is good to establish the context of the book we're about to read so we get an account, you know, like I said, we don't have to imagine what Paul's, you know, ministry in Ephesians or in Ephesus was. Like we have to think about what Paul's ministry in Galatians was. No, we can actually read it. Verse 24 is where we start. And you can read along with me or just listen. Both work. Acts 18, 24. Now a Jew named Apollos... A native of Alexandria came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only of the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And he wished to cross to Acadia, The brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. So right now we get the picture of Apollos going into Ephesus. And he's the first one that touches the untouched fields to do evangelism. He sets sets the stage. 
And then verse, in chapter 19, now Paul comes on the scene. And it happened that while Paul, well, Paulus was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we had not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. So Paul now enters the scene in Ephesus, and you see Apollos' work only that big city, 100,000 people, 12 people were there when Paul got there. 12 people to start the church in Ephesus, starting very, very small. You notice I mentioned multiple different religions, right? The Jews were there, we had pagans. When Paul started his ministry at a new city, he started at a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue. He tried to meet somewhere where they would meet him halfway, right? Because Paul was still preaching and teaching the God of the Old Testament, right? The God of the Jewish scriptures as the true God. And so it's helpful when you do ministry and try to talk about Jesus, because Jesus always points back to God the Father. It's helpful to encounter someone that will meet you halfway there, right? And so Paul would usually start his ministry in the synagogue. And there were synagogues there in Ephesus because there was a large Jewish population there. Synagogues being like how we would think of the church. Grace Lutheran, right? We're, we're a building where we gather all together as Lutherans. A synagogue will be a place where all the Jews gather together and to teach and to read scripture and to, to evangelize to each other. Well, verse 8 of chapter 19, we see it right here. There's 12 men. Where does Paul go first? Verse 8, and he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with them, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord both Jews and Greeks. So what happens? Paul preaches and teaches to the Jews. They reject him. And he says, all right, then I'll start from square zero. I'll start from scratch. I'll go to the pagans, the ones who believe in all these false gods. And we'll say, hey, that temple was made for no reason. We'll start from scratch and maybe they might hear the truth of Jesus. And when Paul starts, remember, I mentioned that this is a port city. A lot of boats and travel in and out and in and out. When Paul was doing his ministry there for two years, he did it. And this is why it says, Acts says, or Luke says in Acts, all the residents of Asia heard about this guy. Paul was making a, a big, big noise in Ephesus. And people were leaving and coming back and saying, hey, you hear about this Paul guy? Here's why. We keep going. Because this is where it gets fun. Verse 11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons that touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the ignorant Jewish exorcists, and ignorant means traveling, so like a, a traveling exorcist, a traveling magician, undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastering, mastered all of them and overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. 
Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them all in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. This is a fun story. Uh, the Holy Spirit's at work in Paul doing miracles, right? Healings. And what happens is there's a lot of, like I said, very pluralistic. Pluralistic means multiple religions. Pluralistic society in Ephesus. A lot of magic arts, magicians doing works there. And so they would use the names of the pagan gods to try to cast spells on people or curses. And certainly... When they saw that even if Paul would touch a handkerchief and they brought if someone sick, they'd be healed, these magicians may have caught on and said, this name of Jesus must have some power. Let's add him to the collection. Let's add him to the collection of our pagan gods. Well, here's the thing about our Christian faith. You don't mix and match God's name with pagan gods. No, 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 no. That's not a good thing. And so what happens, these, these traveling Jewish magicians, they try to use Jesus' name like they would use Artemis' name or one of the pagan gods. And the demons don't respond to that. They say, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? We see this sometimes today, actually, that people mixing Christianity and other religions, even almost little bits of witchcraft. You ever hear of Wiccans? Wiccans are kind of like mini witches, right? You, you go and you, you get your moon crystals and you charge them and you get the energy of the moon to make your day better. Like stuff like that. I don't even heard of this stuff. Like it exists. And people say, I'm a Christian and I do this. Whoo, be careful, right? Our God's a jealous God and he is the one true faith, our Christian faith. And here it is in this picture, in this pluralistic society with all these different faiths. Paul shows everyone there is one true God. Jesus Christ, and fear fell upon them all. And all these magicians, all the, they said the whole city of Ephesus heard about it. Paul is making a huge, huge, uh, well, some might call it a stink. We'll see that in a second. Huge noise in Ephesus, but proclaiming the gospel faithfully, starting with 12 and growing and growing. I want to touch on one more thing before we keep moving. Um, they talk about when people practice the magic arts, they came and they burned their books, and very expensive books practicing magic arts. If you ever call me and say, Pastor, I think my house is demon-possessed, you know what I will do? I'll go to your house and we'll say, do you have anything that might be satanic? Do you have a dream catcher in your house? Do you have any horror movies? Do you have any icons that aren't of Jesus? Do you have anything that isn't a cross? Do you have some statues hanging around? And we'll gather them all up, throw them in the dumpster. Or light a fire and we'll burn it all. And all, just purge it all, right? Purge it all to make it sure that there is only one God in this house. Nothing else is being worshipped. Nothing else is being proclaimed. Just as these magicians do. Burn it all. Start from scratch. Build from faith alone. You start low and you build up as these Ephesian Christians did. Questions, comments? That's a little fun fact for you. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, and these are sold and just, that's, that's, that's right. That's right. Well, if you ever call and say your house is demon possessed, that's, they're going, right? That's a, Yeah. 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 And like I said, I'm the only one that can see. Yeah. Questions, comments? One more chapter of context and then we'll finally get to Ephesians, I promise. Like I said, Paul's making a lot of noise, but he's also making a little bit of, of stink. People probably laughed and said, it's funny that the Jewish magicians, they ran out naked and, and scarred. Ha <laughs> ha, it's so funny. Oh no, my bottom line, I'm trying to sell these Artemis-like Artemis gift shop statues and suddenly this guy is saying this is a false god? Uh, that's affecting my, uh, my income. Let's see. Verse 21 of chapter 19. Now after these events, Paul resolves in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. 
And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way, this being in Ephesus. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business with the workmen, or sorry, brought, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth, and you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger. Not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great god is Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be disposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with confusion. They rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Archus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asarachs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they were came together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward. And Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis? And of the sacred stone that fell from the sky, seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls, let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it will be settled in the regular assembly for we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. <laughs> Paul caused a little bit of chaos. The way I described it, you know, the way I read it, chaotic, right? People rushing in, making accusations. Almost kind of gives you the vibe of the way Jesus was thrown at the Sanhedrin, the way Jesus was thrown on trial, in chaos, all quickly, fast. The only way the crowds calm down is this guy named Alexander shows up and says, hey, don't worry, guys. This is Artemis' city. There, this, this, cult, this, this Christian cult's going to go away. It's not going to be a big deal. It's not going to, uh, you know, destroy your sales revenue or your bottom line. Just don't worry about it. And in that moment, Paul, Paul's name is kind of tarnished. His, his reputation is gone. Three years of ministry he does in Ephesus. This is the biggest, the, sorry, the longest time he spent in one city is Ephesus. His most elaborate ministry is in Ephesus. And like that, once the bottom line is hurt, He's driven out. And so this is the context. I, I went through these two chapters with you to kind of present the context of what is Paul writing to you? What was Paul's experience in Ephesus? Many, many years of good things happening and miracles being done and people being awakened to the truth of the way. And then, boom! People saying, this is Artemis' city. This is Artemis' temple. Look at how great it is. This guy has nothing here. Get him out. Questions, comments? Richard. The Alexander that's referred to him by Alexander the Great, or is it just the guy in Alexander? <laughs> uh, there, are, there are many different Alexanders and multiple different Alexander the Great. Uh, I believe, I'm not 100% sure on this, but this Alexander was one of the, um, the people of authority in the city. I don't think he was. King Alexander the Great, because the Roman, it was Roman Empire at that time, Roman Emperor. Um, but good question. I can, I can do a little bit more digging for you, give you a more comprehensive answer. Oh, 
I, I, I feel bad. See, this is what some people do sometimes in the previous years. Uh, they'll ask me a question that I don't know 100% the answer to, and I spend like 10 hours doing research and for like a, for like a two minute answer. So I love it though. Th thanks, Richard. Any more questions, comments? Do you kind of get signs of the picture of what Paul's ministry in Ephesus was? Going from 12 people all the way to the whole Asia area learning about Jesus to, whoa, almost like another picture, comparison, almost like, uh, remember the story of Moses when all these, these Israelites pop out of nowhere and Pharaoh gets upset being overpowered. The population is being dominated by Israelites. Get them out, get them out. Same thing happens here with the Christian church getting too big and suddenly people got scared because their pockets were not being filled. We don't have to feel bad though, even though Paul never returned to Ephesus, he did live, leave his disciple, his follower Timothy there. And uh, I'm going to turn real quick to 1 Timothy. You guys don't have to. Um, but when we read 1 Timothy, you kind of see how it's all connected. 1 Timothy verse 3, this is chapter 1. As I urged you, this is Paul talking to Timothy, as I urged you when I was returning to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain per persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths or endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is faith. So although Paul was, had to leave Ephesus because he couldn't stay there any longer, he didn't forget the Ephesian Christians. He leave Timothy there, and Timothy's instructed, hey, don't let them devote themselves to false myths. We know what false myths these are. We're talking about Artemis. We're talking about all the pagan gods. Let them be directed in the way, the one true church. And furthermore, here's another cool fun fact for you. Timothy ends up there. You know who else ends up there? John the Apostle. That's where John the Apostle concludes his ministry. Probably after the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, John, he finds his way on the island of Patmos. That's where he wrote, writes Revelation. That's where he started his writing. And then he goes to Ephesus, where he probably wrote the Gospel of John around the Ephesian Christians who treasured him. And there are even stories of him as he got older and older. They would even lift him up to a seat so he could say more and more and preach the Gospel faithfully. So the Ephesian Christians were not forgotten. That's good because how big the city is, they needed constant encouragement so that these myths could not intermingle with the one true faith. Questions, comments? Let's get to Ephesians, shall we? We uh, spent half an hour talking about context, but it's good, it's good. All right, Ephesians, right after Galatians. Yeah, right after Galatians. Okay. Ephesians is a letter of a strengthening, encouraging to you know, the Ephesian Christians who have not gone astray, to keep them faithful and on the right path. Galatians is much more of a, wow, you guys messed up big time, let me correct you. Ephesians is much more of a strengthening, encouraging, hey, keep, keep going on the path. This is what we believe. This is what we, I preached when I was here. Let me remind you what we believe. Again, you're going to hear some familiar stuff from the letter of Galatians. That's good. Remember the question I wanted you to remember in, your, in the back of your mind. Is Paul being consistent here? Is Paul preaching the same things he preached to the churches of Galatia? Let's read. Verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but after hearing the story from Acts about everything Paul went through and the infancy of the church and how it grew, hearing to the saints who are in Christ Jesus and are faithful in him, it hits a little differently. It's more than just a greeting. Paul is reminding them of everything they went through together. You are being faithful in the midst of a pagan city, in the midst of a city with a temple that's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world that you can't look left or right without seeing. You are meeting in people's houses and being faithful together. Let me send my greetings to you. 
In verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Christ is the one who blesses. Not one of these pagan gods. Christ is the one who blesses you with everything. You aren't getting your moon crystals charged so you have some spiritual blessings in heaven. No, it is Christ who has given you every good thing. And what are these good things? Verses 4 to 6. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. What are these spiritual blessings? We're now a part of God's family as adoption, as brothers and sisters. We've talked about this before, right? Adoption in our family. I can call Al my brother. I can call Carolyn my sister because of our adoption, the same baptism together. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God, which means we have a place in His house in heaven. Whew. Nothing greater than that. Here's another cool verse in this section. Verse 4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Over and over and over in Galatians, we ask the question, do we choose God or does God choose us? What's the answer? God chose us. Paul is kind of being consistent here. What we read in Galatians, he's talking about again before you even a twinkle in your father's eye, before God even created elephants or put stars in the sky, he said, I want Patricia as part of my family. What hope that gives us, what comfort that gives us, that we don't have to worry about being spiritual enough, we don't have to worry about being in the right headspace to praise and honor our God, God does all the work in our salvation. We are passive recipients. What we talked about in Galatians, we're talking about again in Ephesians. Questions, comments, because we've got a big topic to talk about next. Making sense so far? All right. There's a P word in this section. Predestination. We're going to talk about predestination today. I think... Uh, Gil, we, we talked about, we mentioned, you mentioned it a couple weeks ago. That's right, that's right. Um, predestination has been a stumbling block for some. I've encountered some Christians and some that are outside the Christian faith that feel like predestination is it's the game changer. They can't believe in a God that would select some and not select others. I'm coming from a Lutheran background. And I'm going to talk about how I piece things thing together. But I'm going to be open and honest with you. I wish I could give you the clearest, most logical answer in the world. But I can't do that. Because we're scripture alone. Remember, if I could explain everything about our God, he wouldn't be God. Who can understand the mysteries of the mind of our God? If we want to try, put God, we call it putting God in a box, trying to explain everything like, it, like it's a science experiment, He's not God anymore if we can know everything about him. But he's above us. Like we are microbes under a microscope. So we're trying to understand what our God is. All we can know is what he's revealed to us in his word. So as I talk about predestination, I'm not going to use logic or reason to try to piece things together. What I'm going to do is to say, okay, what does scripture say about predestination? Scripture says a couple things. One, Christ loves everyone and died for the whole world, not just Christians. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Loved the world. It's one. Two. God desires that everyone would be in heaven with him. God desires that everyone would be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 4. God our Savior desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 
3. God has chosen those who will be saved. He has chosen an elect. We hear it right here in Ephesians, right? What, what, is, what does Paul say? He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And four, not all people will be saved. The Bible talks about this too. In Luke 13, 22, we, we talk about the, um, oh, is it the, the narrow way. We talk about the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, 41, where some are set apart, the sheep and the goats. Not everyone is saved. The Bible is very clear about that. So the tough question we have to ask then is, if God loves everyone, why are only some elect? Does God choose some to be saved? Because it logically follows if God chooses some to be saved, he also chooses some people to not be saved. This is a concept called double predestination. Lutherans don't believe that. Because we look in here in Ephesians, is there anything that says that God chooses people not to be set up for adoption? That before the foundation of the world, God chose some of you to not be saved? There's nothing in there about that, right? All we know is that God chooses some to be saved, and some aren't. How do we logically piece that together, the paradox of a God of love? We, we can't. But you could choose to save you, and you could say, you know what, I choose not to save you. Maybe because you, you, you didn't obey his word, or you didn't do this or that, and he could say, you know, I could say, I will save you, and maybe I will. Well, and he doesn't have to save you. Well, the comfort it's, not like, it's not like if he says, oh, I'm, I'm not going to save you. Oh, it's not like that's a sin. It's just words. Well, the comfort is, Rachel, God doesn't select people to not be saved. God only chooses people to be elect, to be part of his family. No one here is hopeless. No one out there is hopeless. No one is beyond saving. There is no sin that is unforgivable. There is no sinner that can't be forgiven. This is the hope that we have in our gospel message. How do we logically piece together the interconnected themes of predestination? We can't. All we can do is present, this is what God says, and it leads to a paradox. A God of love electing only some. How does that make sense? There's a lot about our God that doesn't make sense to us. There's a lot of paradoxes we see in our God. How could God, an immortal God, die? But he did. Paradox. How can what we do on Sunday be the true body and blood of Jesus, and not just in there, but in every church in the country all at the same time? How can God be in more than one place at once? We can't explain that. It's the mysteries of our God. I was going down a rabbit hole. I was talking about Richard about rabbit holes. <laughs> How can, how, can, how can there be one God in every single church? Well, that's, how can the one God be in different churches at the same time? Well, Rachel, I think you're piecing together. That it's hard to understand, right? It is a mystery. God is beyond us. Like he can't be, let's say he can't be here. Let's say there's a church here and there's a church here. He... Does he have to pick one? Like, how does he no. pick one church and then go to the other? God can see all and God is present everywhere. And we don't understand that because we can only be present in one place at a time, right? He can see all the churches from up there. Mm -hmm. He can see everything. That's right, that's right. I was talking to Richard, I was talking about like wormhole or uh, rabbit holes. I was looking at, you know, famous actors, what they believe about faith. Because it's really fun to see what famous actors believe about faith because uh, they're all over the place. And I was uh, reading something about Morgan Freeman, what Morgan Freeman believes. And he's asked, do you believe people invented God? And he says, yes. Do, do you believe that people invented God? And he says, yes. Well, of course, because yeah, yeah. Well, the concept of God, right? The concept of religion that has been invented, right? 
And one argument towards that God was invented is, well, if people can understand everything about God, then obviously someone had to dream them up. But here we are all in the same room going, we can't understand the fullness of our God, right? Yeah. And, and, well, we'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit later, okay, Rachel? We'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, we can't understand the fullness of our God, else he wouldn't be God. It's very humbling to be a Christian, I mentioned before, right? Because we have to say there are some things we don't understand. There are paradoxes. But guess what? Can God exist within paradoxes? Does God have to confine himself to the logic systems that we have? Nope. God created logic. Just like God doesn't have to obey the Sabbath, because guess what? He created that too. So we have the hope that, you know, as we struggle with the doctrine of predestination, we know what God has revealed to us. We don't have to logically piece things together. What God has revealed to us is that this, God loves all people and we are his elect. And so we, uh, yep, his chosen people, right? And we don't know who out there is chosen. So what we do, go and make disciples of all nations. Go serve our neighbor. Go show the love of Christ to everyone. We don't go out and say, well, God select him some and not others, so why evangelize? Why care about any of them? No, we go out and serve. Go, 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 kill. But yet in Romans, there's a part in there that says that uh, if you do evil and you do not relent, then you'll destroy Sure. If you relent, yep. no matter how evil you are, you will be saved. Sure. And Gil, I think you're... I, this, that's a good segue, right? The principle that I want to talk about that we'll see over and over in Scripture and we'll see over and over in Ephesians 2. All good things are from God. All bad stuff is our fault. All the blessings we have, every breath we take, is a gift from God. God doesn't cause us to sin. God doesn't make us mess up our lives. We, we've done that ourselves. And so we do repent. We do come to him. And the good news is this. God is more than willing to provide his forgiveness. We don't have to earn it. God gives it to us freely. It is a gift. So that's the hope and principle we see over and over and over again. It mentions from your passage in Romans, right? That all good things are from God and all the bad we've done to ourselves. Any questions on predestination? <laughs> But I just thought about yeah. this. Just, I just, this just popped in my head. You know how you say, um, like, we, it's, we all have a gift? Like, uh, well, this just popped in my head. Like, if you, you like, you, because you, you talked about this on Sunday or something, and you said, God, you have a gift. But if you, if you just use the gift, let's say you say, you say, oh, he gave me a gift, so that means I can do whatever I want. No. No, no. that's right. That's right. And we'll talk about that more later, Rachel. Good. Yes. Yes. So if someone came up to you and said, do you believe in predestination or not? What would your answer be? We've got to be careful because the way predestined, the word predestination is thrown around, it has bad connotations, right? I would say, I believe God chooses his elect and we don't know who they are. So we don't base our life decisions on that. We go out and do what God has asked us and serve our neighbor and love one another and believe that no one's unsavable. Does that answer the question right? Yeah, I, I would be careful throwing predestination around because I've encountered people too that the second they hear predestination, they're like, well, there's no hope for me. I'm never coming to church. I'm, I'm, not, I'm obviously not chosen. They make a joke out of it sometimes, right? Yeah, I'm not chosen, so ha ha. Good, good question. Al, yep. I always pondered about that uh, predestination. Is it possible uh, that God knows everything uh, before and after? Yep. Yep. And he already knows who's going to save him or not, and that creates predestination. He knows if someone's going to save him because he sees everything in the future. Sure, sure. And I would go a step further. You know, it's not just foreknowledge, he straight up chose. So he, he, it's not just he knows who's going to be saved. He, he, Paul's pretty clear. He predestined, he chose who's going to be saved. That's why he knows. Um, and it's going to be you, Al. And you have that comfort, right? How do you know you're going to be saved? You're here. You're hearing the word of God. You receive faith in your heart. You confess Jesus as Lord only because the Holy Spirit gives you the power to do so. 
And so the idea of predestination, you know, we use it as a comfort that God does all the work. It's, it can actually be a doctrine of comfort. I mean, Paul's not using it so that you'd be scared. What is Paul saying here in verse 5? This is a good thing. In love he predestined us for adoption to in himself. This is a good thing that God has chosen us. But so often, as Don pointed out, right, predestination can be used as a scare tactic, as a scary doctrine. But that's not how Paul is using it here. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And from like what you were saying, um, growing up, this is one of the things that my mom used to always say that, you know, obviously God already knows yep. what, what our destination is. Yep. He created us. He knows where we come from. So he knows who's going to be saved, who's not going to be saved. However, it's our free will on whether or not we're going to follow those commandments and follow his law at the end of that. So I'm just wondering, is it possible because of the different types of religions that a lot of the books over the years was just a lot of stuff was being, you know, a lot of the translation got lost. That is a, that, because that's a weak Bible study. Well, no, we'll, no, yeah, no, yeah. I no, no, that's good. No, 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 no. This is, like, this is like Richard. This is like Richard. I will make a Bible study for you. Yeah. <laughs> This is a good topic. I'll just a thousand things to say. A thousand things to say. I will. I'll just point this out. You know, who gave the ability? Who gives the thief of the cross the ability to confess faith? God does. God gives the credit. Who gives us the ability to do good things and obey God's commandments? Sure, that but was one of the things that, like, why Adam and Eve got stuck in one Jesus died on the cross. Sure. And you're discovering right here, right? All good things are from God. All bad stuff is on us. That's the flesh. That, that's right. Right? So, good deeds, we can't even breathe without God inter intervening for us. All good things we do are God. All the obedience to the commandments. If it were on me, I'd be disobeying every single one of them. In fact, I do when it's on me. Carolyn, yeah, yeah. Where does Satan come in? <laughs> where, where does Satan come in? That's a great question, right? Well, Satan is there to tempt us to follow our flesh. Also part of our free will. Oh, now we're, now we're getting to free will, right? Yep. Yep. So, so here's, here's how we view free will. I'm gonna, this is a whole different topic, but I'm going to briefly cut at it, right? Uh, okay. No, this is great. I, I love this. No, this is really good. No, it's on your mind. I want to talk about it, right? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a hunch it's on the minds of some other people too, right? We have free will. We will always choose to follow our flesh by our own merits. Only because of God can we ever believe in him. Only because of God can we ever obey him. When you see people do good works, serving other, giving food to the poor, that's God at work. There's a verse, I, this is kind of next, next week. Um, verse 10 of chapter 2 in Ephesians. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, with God, which God prepared beforehand. God has already made the good works that you're going to do. Man, God's at work in your lives. You have evidence of it. When you go out and serve the poor, we're going to have a, a shoebox donation next week. Uh, we're going to start next week for, for Christmas kids, right? You fill gifts in there. You do that, God, that's evidence God's at work in your life. We're going to have a Thanksgiving drive where we collect food. You, you do that, that's God, that's God at work in your life. God transforms who you are. We can't. And it's very humbling to think that, right? It's very humbling to say, it, with my own free will, I would only go wrong. And some of you who have lived lives outside of the Christian faith for any experience, any length of time, you, you see that, right? We don't, we don't fix our lives. We don't make our lives good on our own. Only God, only Christ can do that. Even when I, when I help out with the skin and drive, that's another way God's going to sh show me grace into my life. Yep. That I want to help. God's at work in your life there, Rachel. That's right. That's a comfort. That's a hope you have. Questions, comments. Because he's in him. That's why. God is everywhere. Christ is everywhere. Jesus is everywhere because he's in you. You live the word of God and you live right by him. He's healthy. That's why he's able to be in every church. Yeah, Al. <laughs> Say it again. That's a question or a statement? Statement. 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 They're absolutely right. All powerful and everywhere. That's our God. Interesting to, to make a comparison, right? You talk about Satan. Satan is not everywhere. He's a fallen angel. He can only be in one place at one time. His demon, that's why he has demons working overtime and attempt. That's right. Yeah, so, so, he's, he's got helpers that help him, right? But Satan can only be in one place at one time, but God's everywhere. Right? And we have the hope that, you know, God is here and he can't conquer us. Right? A dream catcher, right? I'm going to talk about this on, on Sunday. This is a kind of a uh, prelude to a sermon. I'm going to talk about... I'm, yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm going to talk about... Sh yeah, that's, right. that's right. Should Christians celebrate Halloween? Oh, this is, this is good, right? I'll tell you this. Yeah. I celebrate Halloween, yep. but I still come to church. Yep. So, I still to so we'll talk about that in a little bit, right? And about demonic powers and all that. Because Christians believe they exist. And Halloween's a day where it's kind of celebrated a little bit, or maybe I not, you know? I just celebrate because it's fun. Richard. One thing I'll say, because I love the Halloween movie franchise. Yes. Uh, in the second movie, they bring up uh, the ceremony, like the Celtics used to do. Yeah. The Samhain and the, the Harvest. So that's, that's right. like the day where they were. Sure. So how it's translated into a modern connotation where people go around like masks. You know, it's kind of oh, it's exciting. I think a lot of you are going to like this sermon. Oh, it's a little teaser. Yeah. Gil. Halloween brought by the pagans against All Saints Day or a holy holiday to offset. I don't know for sure, but my hunch is it was the other way around. Just like Christmas was a pagan holiday that Christians appropriated. I'm actually, you know what? I think Halloween. I think you are right. I think All Saints Day was first, and Halloween came second. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll look into that a little bit. So, Richard, I love that comment. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about all this uh, on Sunday and next week too. Um, these are good questions. I love this. Disc don't feel bad. This is good. This is really good. No, no, this is... When you go to all the churches, the saying is, everybody says if you don't believe in my religion, you go to hell. Everybody says if you don't believe in my religion, then everybody's going to hell, I guess. Because everyone says that every church has a different God. I don't know. But that, that's just what they say. You know, yeah. My dad told me that when I changed to the Lutheran faith, I was, right. I was Catholic and she's like, right. how long do you go? Well, the, the thing, you know... There, there, there is, you can be unifying to the point where all of a sudden we're all just one happy, godless family where we just worship kind of the space and whatever we call anything a god. We can also be schismatic and saying Catholics aren't going to heaven. They're our brothers and sisters. They confess Christ, don't they? 
Christ, that's who saves, right? Oh, the Methodists aren't going to heaven. Oh, the Baptists aren't going to heaven. Oh, the non noms aren't going to heaven. We don't believe that. Because I've, I've had people yep. where I'll sit there and they'll tell me, oh, there's not, like, I'll tell them, you know, they'll tell me there's not a God, there's not a hell, there's not heaven. Mm. Or like, you know, if you want to think that, you can think that, but when the day you die, you're going to stand up on the altar and you're going to confess to Jesus Christ all the bad stuff that you've done. Mm. When he finds out that you've done all that stuff, and when you go to hell, mm. On that note, I think we'll close up for today. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Um, we got through six verses, so I think a good job today. Uh, we'll go at a much faster pace next week for sure, but I love the discussion today. Um, it was great. Um, what's up? No rush. That's right. That's right. Any final questions before we pray it up? I hope I talked about predestination in the right way. I think it make, you know, make, make sense, right? The fact that it doesn't make sense is what makes sense, right? Right? Yep. God chooses us, but sometimes people will choose to plus the gift of wedding. That's right. It's like they, you know, God gives us all the gift. That's right. But if I say, yeah. He died for all people. His grace is for everybody. Right? That's right. Let's pray, shall we? Dear God, Father, I thank you that we could all come together in your word. Your word is truth, and it points us to Jesus, who died for our sins and conquered death for us, so that one day from the grave we're going to rise from the dead, and we're going to see you face to face with our brothers and sisters who held on to the faith in the midst of the world that's so divisive, so pluralistic, just like Paul's world in Ephesus. We know the truth. Help us to keep reading the Bible as faithful interpreters that we might be strengthened and nurtured in our doctrine and our faith, that we might go out and be able to speak about it to others, those that may not agree with us, that might vehemently disagree with us. We might know what we believe and what we believe to be true. Keep us all safe this night. Bless our week and remind us of the grace that you have given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. We'll see you on Sunday. See you on Wednesday.